because I'm already nervous about being there, which is a shame because this is family property. None of us should be scared to go to our property. And yeah, no one's lived there in 20 years, but that doesn't mean it belongs to them. After I turn the lights on, I see what it's doing. He's going back and forth across this little 10 foot wide iron ore road. He's bent over with his arms nearly dragging the ground and he's swaying his arms in unison and his legs were bent at the knee. And seeing this thing, absolutely shocking. Because this is not the same one I saw the first time. This one had a lot less hair and it's taller. And now I know I'm in trouble. But I, I don't want to take my eyes off of him. And I'm standing in between the fire and my truck. So I walk backwards, I grab the rifle, and then it throws this huge log and I can hear it coming through the air and it's coming fast it's whistling he threw it so hard if I hadn't moved it would have hit me but he's intentionally throwing it at me and in my mind I'm thinking this is just a huge human and I was oh I oh. I was drawn a blank. Uh, it took every bit of brain power I had to realize what it is, what I'm actually looking at, because it looks so much like a person. But it's acting like a primate. And then the screaming started immediately and there are pine cones and rocks I'm trying to duck and dodge and I'm being hit with them and it hurts I've got a knot on the side of my head the one I got popped with I realized I'm not getting out of there it's gonna get me I've got tears just streaming down my face and, and I actually didn't mean to hit him. I just wanted to scare him off. And I was shaking so much. It was just a lucky shot. And I watched him fall through the scope. And I can hear him groaning. And I heard that. I had this feeling come over me that you just killed a person. I felt I've committed a sin, that I did something immoral. I still feel pretty crummy about it. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that, that shocked me. They don't make people that, that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language, and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. 
I know what a bear looks like, and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. I hear Timothy Renner from Strange Familiars Podcast is looking for where my footprints went. Tell him a little town call. None of your damn business. This is Bigfoot, and you are listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, We're going to be chatting with Chris. And uh, Chris is actually sitting at Monkey Pond right now, uh, what we call Monkey Pond out there in East Texas. Uh, But uh, Chris and I were talking the other day, and he was telling me about three different uh, encounters he had on this property his family owns out there in East Texas. No one really lives there anymore. Uh, Chris's dad has sadly passed away, and... He went out there to, you know, find some peace and and relax, and he was starting to have run-ins with these creatures. Uh, Very fascinating encounters. And, you know, the aggression, I think, has shown. And I know, you know, Chris is a good man. He feels bad about shooting this creature. Uh, But, you know, in his position, I don't know that I would have done anything different. And I think after you listen to the situation he was in, you know, I would have shot the thing, too. Uh, it's a very terrifying encounter, and I, I really want to thank Chris for coming forward and, and sharing it. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. I'll be back on Sunday for the members. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Chris to the show. Uh, Chris, thanks for being here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I know that you actually own this property. Your family owned it for a long time. And I know your your dad has sadly passed away and um, you still own the property. You go out there. And tonight, what I'd like to do is talk about the three different encounters that you had on the property. If you would, Chris, just kind of walk us into the first encounter to kind of tell us what you were doing and... And what happened? Because my very first encounter was during the uh, winter, the very first little winter storm we had here, which was in January. We had a light dusting of snow and ice. And I thought this would be a, a perfect opportunity to go to Burkeville and check everything out and see what I can see. I get there and I make my camp, unload the ATV, and I don't go anywhere unless I'm armed. Uh, I had a pretty powerful and pretty popular AR and uh, 45. And I had them both strapped to me. I had a, a headlamp on. So I rode down our iron ore road. And I get to the very back of the property, which is like a a two-mile drive. And I'm seeing this soft white glow coming from about 20 foot up in a tree. Now, what it actually was, was my LED light bar on the ATV reflecting a creature's eyes. But I'm not anything like that because I still actually had a pretty healthy skepticism. So I get within 50 yards of it, 
and I turn the folder around, I hop off, and I'm walking up to it, and I'm looking back and forth, left to right, and I hear a loud up, and immediately following was a growl, and I stopped dead in my tracks, I looked up, I didn't see anything at first, I saw what I thought was a tree growing kind of sideways. I uh, looked again, and it was patchy hair. And I said, that is not a tree, oh, my God. And I looked down, and I started backing up. It growled again. I froze solid, and I really hate to admit this, but I urinated all over myself. I would have, too. I've seen them up close. I mean, there's no shame in it. I mean, uh, people can chuckle all they want, but I'll tell you what, you get up close and you, you'll you find yourself in the very same position. No shame in that at all, ma'am. Yeah, that... I'm sorry, man. <laughs> this is... I got my... my, my uh, it's pretty hot. <laughs> uh, wow. Well. But yeah, uh, and um, at this point, I'm wanting to just lay down and curl up in a ball. And I'm looking down at the snow and the ice on the ground, and I'm hearing the crunching. So it's coming at me. And I refuse to look up. I refuse to make eye contact with it because i uh, Pretty sure if I did, that was going to be my final resting place. I started backing up, and it stood there. And I peeked up one time, it saw me, and started showing its teeth. And these were very large, rectangular-looking teeth. And that was pretty frightening. And it kind of, kind of blue raspberry, um, I'm wanting to say. It was a pretty weird noise that it made, but its top lip had come up, and I could see the top row of its teeth, and it just kind of, I was like, okay. I like that. So I'm going to take that as a warning. So I get to my ATV, and I get within 10 feet of it, and I started running. And I, I think that was a mistake, because as I'm mounting the ATV, I can hear steps coming rapidly. And I just mashed the gas and was gone. I, I have that thing strumming at stupid speeds. Uh, this road that we have is, hasn't been graded in you know over 20 years, so it's got washout spots and pretty deep ruts in certain spots. And if had I hit them at that speed, uh, that also would have been the end of me. But I got back to my truck, you know, unharmed. Thank God. And I barricaded myself in the truck. I got in the back seat and I pulled everything over on top of me. <laughs> and just kind of hid, hoping that it wouldn't come up to the front and harass me. But I'm hearing screaming all night. I'm hearing whooping. And I laid there until the sun started coming up. Uh, I didn't hear anything at that point for about two or three hours. So I got in the front of the truck, started it, and let the sun come up completely before I loaded my ATV up and I left everything else. Uh, I just, I come back to the Conroe. Uh, I got home and decided I was going to lay down because I wasn't feeling very well. Uh, I had a severe headache and I felt 
nauseous. So I lay down and I slept about 12 hours. I woke up with the pain in my chest uh, the next morning and I had to wind up calling 911 because I was having a heart attack. And they come and got me and took me to the hospital, gave me uh, nitroglycerin. And I was there for three, four days. They released me, tell, telling me that none of the tests that they ran showed anything wrong. So I thought, okay, well, what could it have been? They said, maybe it was heartburn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's all right. As you give me nitro for heartburn. So I was pretty shaken up for several days after that. And I started feeling better. And I started getting my confidence back. And I thought, well, I've got to find out exactly what's going on. This is family property. And I'm not the only one that goes there. I need to know, I don't want someone else going up there and getting hurt or something worse. So I decide about a, a month later, actually it was, uh, my father passed uh, on Valentine's Day. And we had him buried. Uh, Actually, two, it was almost two weeks later because of that art of blast we had. We couldn't get anything done that entire week. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your dad. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so he was buried on a Thursday. I took the rest of the week off and decided I was going to go to the ATV park. I was going to camp there. And I was going to go over to the house, to the property, and check everything out, see what was going on. So that's what I did. Uh, I rode around at the ATV park, had fun, barbecued, and after the sunset, I decided I was going to go back over to the house and just stay in my truck. I was not going to get out. I wasn't going to do anything that I was going to regret. Well. My cousin had called me a couple of days prior and said she was just out there that previous weekend and that they had finished logging. They logged 50 something acres of the property and she was really upset about it because this is a beautiful piece of property and it's been in our family since I think 1920. Uh, we were all pretty much raised there. It's it's home to us. So uh, I told her I'd go by and check it out. Well, I get up there and I pull down. I start heading down the iron ore road. And I have the ATV in the back. And the ATV is 800 pounds. There is a spot in the road from the logging. Well, there's a pretty large rut from the logging trucks. and. My cousin had got stuck in it and had to have someone come pull her out. So I pull up to the spot. I'm looking at it and I'm trying to determine if I have too much weight in the back of the truck. Maybe I should back up, unload, and then try to get down the road. Well, as I'm sitting there, there is an air splitting whistle and then a second and these two whistles are less than 20 yards apart from each other and about 10 yards to my left and it just come out of nowhere and it scared the living hell out of me i'm trying to figure out what is this freaking noise what is going on it sounds like it has a mechanical tone. All right. Okay. So is there someone here with a PA and an amp? Are they playing some type of sick joke on me? 
But this property doesn't have any electricity. It hasn't had any since uh, 2001. I was the last one to live there. So it would be impossible <laughs> for that to be a PA or anything that requires electricity. So that rules out any type of an alarm. Uh, couldn't have been a bird. There is no bird that is that loud. And no human that can whistle that loud either. And my hearing is pretty poor. And it's causing me to cover my ears. So I start backing up. And this noise slowly stops. And I said, okay, well, that's really weird. So I pulled back forward. And it started again. And at one point, I rolled down the window about three or four inches and just kind of stuck my mouth over to the crack and yelled, shut the hell up. When I did, it seemed to pause for a second. I said, okay. I'm like, that's really weird. And I'm thinking this has got to be some type of a pressure alarm. So I grab my flashlight and I like like actually, what what kind of alarm did you say, Chris? Uh, a pr a pressure. Oh, I pressure! Thinking, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I was thinking there had to be a pressure pad or something underneath the truck, but you know, it doesn't make any sense. I'm just my brain was trying to rationalize every situation, but. I'm rolling them out pretty fast because there's no neighbors for several miles. There's nothing and no one around. There is one way in and out of this property because it's bordered by Cow Creek. So I went to get out of the truck and it seemed to pause momentarily again. And I jumped right back in the truck and locked the door. I said, nope. I said, uh-uh. I said, there is definitely something making that noise, something that breathes and lives. So I'm back all the way up to the house, to the White House. I'm sitting there, and there's no noise no nothing it's just dead silent getting a really creepy feeling there is something in the distance and it's staring at me i see it i can see it silhouette and i'm starting to get incredibly angry i have a bit of a temper uh i'm a pretty big guy, and I really need to get my ass kicked good one day. That would probably stop my timber problems. But, uh, I get out, and I've got my pistol, my rifle, leaning up against the truck. I get a fire started. Well, as I'm tending to the fire, getting it stoked up, I hear this god-awful, uh, I want to call it a laugh, but it was, I hate to use this term because I don't want to sound like I'm a religious nut. Uh, I apologize if anyone out there is religious, but I'm not calling you a nut. But I just don't want to sound that way. It sounded demonic. That's the only thing I can compare it to. Because it's so loud and just had connotations of wanting to cause pain. And I was absolutely terrified. I get back in the truck and I'm sitting there for another 10, 15 minutes and I, I convince myself that someone is in the woods and they have a bullhorn and they're jacking with me. So I get back out and I start talking 
out loud yelling, you better come out or I'm going to shoot. I'm not playing games with you. Whoever you are, uh, I think I have a pretty good idea. So come out now. And I hear this gibberish. You know, it was... I really don't know what to make of it. Uh, I said a couple other choice phrases that I'm not going to repeat, but it responded. Every time I said something, it responded. And I picked my rifle up, and it yelled, it screamed, loud. I nearly dropped my rifle. But I start threatening to shoot. It's just going off. And I can hear something else to my left. It had went through the field, or one of them had went through the field, or they were throwing something and was trying to divert my attention to my left. At this point, I'm, I'm shaking. I'm nearly convulsing. I'm shaking so bad. I pull my rifle up and I look through the scope. And I can see a very large pine tree that was in the field. I aim towards it and I let around loose. And there was dead silence for about a minute. And then I hear more crunching and breaking and really loud and sounded like limbs being broken. And this is coming from my left. So I chamber another round and I fired in that direction. And then there was silence again for another minute. But now I'm getting this feeling that they're done playing and that they're about to just bum rush me and that's going to be the end of it. So I threw everything in the truck, left the fire burn and I hauled ass. Yeah. I feel for you, Chris, especially being your, you know, your family property. And I always said, you know, someone in fear, give them a gun. They will shoot someone. You know, I think we as humans, that's, if we're just trying to it's self-preservation. Um, do you think you actually hit it? Um, I'm pretty certain I hit it because the way they were screaming afterwards, or I may have came close, but my last encounter, I absolutely did hit it because there was blood on the ground. Yeah. Tell me about that. You know, I really want to hear that encounter and the situation you were in. Um, if you would, Chris, just take your time. I know it, it, it's kind of a tough situation to talk about, but take your time and, and walk us into what happened. What happened uh, this past weekend, actually. I went back, once again, back to the park. You know, I, I love riding my ATV, and I love that area. It puts me at peace to be in this area and to be out in the woods. That's why I'm in the Sam right now. <laughs> I went back and I was told from someone who wants to remain completely anonymous that if you show them you're not scared of them, they will leave you alone. As if you fire. As they won't come back. As they'll pick up and haul ass and that'd be it. So I'm pretty confident that he's right because this fellow has been doing this for many, many years. And he's been on your show. But what I failed to realize is that I did leave. So they're thinking they ran me off. And here I come again. I need to be taught a major lesson. So I get out of the truck. And this is 
about midnight, 1230, maybe one. You know, I'd spent a lot of time over at the park riding and just trying to get back to normal, trying to find my center, you know, after the death of my father and all the problems we're having with the will and everything. It's just, it's been a really crazy year already. Last year, we discovered I have an older sister, so that was a shock. <laughs> but, yeah, so immediately, I get out of the truck, and I'm having these creepy feelings that I'm being watched again. I thought, oh, God, I said, this, this is... I said, I'm psyching myself out. I said, that's all it is. I'm psyching myself out. But just in case, maybe you better get your rifle out. And I have a extremely powerful rifle. It's a 338 Lapua. And I'm a gun nut. <laughs> and I've got it leaned up against my mirror. And I'm trying to start another fire. And... I have a pine cone come zinging at me. And I dropped everything. I grabbed the rifle. And I looked up. And I don't see anything. So I cut on my headlights, my light bar. I get my flashlight out. And I put it on the hood and turn it on. I need every bit of light that I have. Because I'm already nervous about being there. Which is a shame. Because this is family property. None of us should be scared to go to our property. And yeah, no one's lived there in 20 years, but that doesn't mean it belongs to them. But I'm sure that's what they think. After I turn the lights on, I see what it's doing. He's going back and forth across this little 10-foot wide iron ore road. And he's bent over. Well, I say he. I, I don't really know for sure that I didn't see any breasts, but he's bent over with his arms nearly dragging the ground and he's swaying his arms in unison and his legs were bent at the knee and it looks like he's about to attempt a barrel roll it is the way he's crossing this road back and forth and seeing this thing, absolutely shocking. Because this is not the same one I saw the first time. This one had a lot less hair, and it's taller. And now I know I'm in trouble. And it keeps looking to it, what, it crossed the road, and it stopped over by the edge of the tree line. And he keeps looking to his right. And I don't know exactly what he's doing or why he's doing it. But I'm getting the feeling that he's wanting me to look that direction for some reason. But um, I don't want to take my eyes off of him. And I'm standing in between the fire and my truck. And he starts going back and forth again. And he did this about four or five times, and he'll stop. And he'll look to his right. I didn't realize it, but I had walked about 10 feet in front of the fire and in front of my truck. And I realized what I was doing by the wind blowing and blowing up the back of my shirt. And really startling me because I thought, okay, well, he's got me. <laughs> so I walked backwards. I grabbed the rifle. And then it throws this huge log. And I can hear it coming through the air. And it's coming fast. It's whistling. He threw it so hard. And it landed and rolled. If I hadn't have moved, it would have hit me, but he's intentionally throwing it at me. And in my mind, 
I'm thinking, this is just a huge human. And I was, uh, I was drawing a blank. Uh, it took every bit of brain power I had to realize what it is, what I'm actually looking at, because it looks so much like a person, but it's acting like a primate. And I hear snapping to my left, and I'm thinking, well, this one is coming closer. This has got to be the one I saw the first time. Because this one directly in front of me is different. So I fired to the left again. And then the screaming started immediately. And there are pine cones and rocks. I'm trying to duck and dodge. And I'm being hit with them. And it hurts. I've got a knot on the side of my head. The one I got popped with. And that one hit me incredibly hard. I realized I'm not getting out of there. It's going to get me. I've got tears just streaming down my face. And I, and I actually didn't mean to hit him. I just wanted to scare him off. I aimed center mass, and I was shaking so much. I was I'm really surprised. It was just a lucky shot. Well, I pulled the trigger and hit him, and I watched him fall through the scope. And I can hear him groaning. And I heard that. I had this feeling come over me that you just killed a person. I felt I've committed a sin, but I did something immoral. And I'm going to pay for it one way or another. I still feel pretty crummy about it. I wish I could take it back. I wish I could take it back. Yeah, I feel for you, Chris, and I'm sorry you were put in that position and the way you feel now, but, you know, what's the alternative? Either you get them or they get you. Um, I don't know that I would have done anything different. I probably would have shot way before uh, you actually shot, and I was having flashbacks as you were talking about the log being thrown at you and the noise of it going through the air because I, I experienced something very similar not far from where this happened to you and you're right you can hear it coming through the air it's like a helicopter blade you know as the logs going from end to end being thrown um you know i i don't think i would have done anything different i understand the way you feel i think you're a good man and i think that's why you're feeling bad about the situation but i, I don't think i would have done anything different than you did i probably would have shot way sooner and probably a lot more than you did uh, you were protecting yourself. I was frightened. And I'm, I'm still frightened. And like I said, this is family property. And I don't want anyone else to get hurt. If I have to sacrifice myself to keep my brothers or my sister, uh, that's... <laughs> that's Still sounds weird because I've got three brothers. And for 40 years, it was just a four of us. And now we have an older sister. 
Yeah, that's strange. I mean, to lighten the mood a little bit, how how did you know you had a sister? I mean, how did that come about? Or if you don't want to talk about it, you could say none of your business and you won't hurt my feelings. So. Oh, no, no, no. That's not, man. Uh, my, my dad, he's in pretty bad health. He had a, a liver transplant seven years ago. I guess he knew that his time was getting short. He and I both knew it uh, because I I moved in with him over here and he needed help. My brother couldn't be there 24-7. So, and we didn't always have a healthy relationship. At one point, we were pretty toxic to each other. So, when he got out of the hospital, I wanted to make, make up and spend time with him because I knew he wasn't going to last because liver patients, even after getting transplants, do not live a full, long life. I didn't want any regrets. So I moved in and I said, I think he knew his time was getting short. So he got into touch with his ex-girlfriend, which is the woman he dated before he met my mother. She told him, you know, I've been contemplating telling you this for 44 years now, Kenneth, but you have a daughter. My oldest is yours. And he told her, you know, he said, I kind of had a feeling. Got the blood test done, and sure enough, she's one of us. Oh, my God. <laughs> and she is actually, from what I know of her, she has a very similar personality to me. And I'm not surprised. <laughs> well, it's very cool. It sounds like it was kind of a blessing, really, you know, out of a terrible situation kind of a blessing you know and having uh, a a new person in the tribe part of the tribe now right right and, and yes it, it it is certainly a blessing any any child is a blessing um i don't have any kids uh my daughter actually died 14 years ago today oh man it's tragic i'm so yeah. sorry to hear that Parents, parents should never bury their kids. You know, it, it's something that I can't even, it, it's hard to say the right thing because I can't even imagine being in that situation, right. you know. Right, that's that's not the natural order. No, it's not. It's really not. Yeah, I mean, man, what a day, you know. I kind of understand now why you're, down where you're at and you know when when nothing's around uh monkey pond it's a beautiful area it really is it's it's um it's only when these things come around that ruin it other than that it's probably one of the coolest places i've been because you're isolated but you're not it's not like you gotta drive two days to get there you know right Um, right yeah no i mean I, i and as far as shooting that one you know i I wouldn't, we can only do what we can do. You know, if you're like, Hey, I was bored and, uh, you know, I wanted to target practice, you know, even then I don't have a lot of love for these creatures, but I'm not even sure I'd feel even feel bad if he said that to me, but I mean, that really wasn't the case. And I think in the situation you were in, I, I don't think I would have done anything different. You know what's strange out there in Texas is it really, I, they're like in little pockets around there, um, little areas where the locals know they're there. Um, and go, they don't speak about it. Yeah, and we can come back to this last one. But on that first encounter, you know, for someone who's never seen a Sasquatch before, can you kind of describe what you saw? Hey, the, the easiest way I can compare it is would be that the first one actually I would say was seven foot tall, maybe not even that tall, between between six eight and seven foot. And it wasn't really as big as 
I was expecting or from what I've heard is hearing about them. You know, you get this image of the 11 foot tall beast covered in hair with huge fangs. And that's not at all what I saw. What, what I saw said was six, eight, seven foot and was built kind of like an athlete. He was lean, but still muscular and had patches of hair. The hair on his face, he didn't have any hair around his eyes, his nose, or his cheeks. But everywhere else, he had really thin, almost curly-looking hair. And the hair on his chest was thinner than his stomach. It got pretty thick on his stomach. He had gray skin, and it looks like a pair of gloves. Yeah, I appreciate you going into the details. They're creepy to look at. And you're right, down there in Texas, I would say from most eyewitnesses, your average height is six, seven, maybe eight feet tall. And up here in the Pacific Northwest, they're definitely larger uh, for whatever reason. Right. I just think it's just maybe the genetics of the this Texas tribe or troop. Yeah, I've always but, wondered if it was resources. You know, because Texas, there is a, you know, if you've never been to East Texas, it looks a lot like Washington State. It's green and it's dense. And, yeah. but I, I'm not so sure that it, they have all the resources, resources like we do in Washington. That That's my opinion. I could be way off on it. Who knows, you know? Oh, you're, hey, you, <laughs> I've said it before. Uh, your opinion is a lot more valuable than you think, man. I mean, you've been doing this for 10 years now and you've interviewed the world's premier Bigfoot researchers. So if anyone knows what they're talking about, it's you, you know? So <laughs> well, I appreciate that. <laughs> I don't know. I, a lot of it's opinions, you know, it's opinions you, you form based on uh, people's experiences and your own experiences and, I would like to say I have all the answers and I don't. It is cool to hear people's encounters because you do get an education from it. I give a lot of the jerk researchers a hard time. And I, I know I always say researcher and I use it in a real vague term. Not all researchers are, are, are bad people. There, there are some good ones out there. But, um, you know, after you hear encounter after encounter after an encounter, uh, the audience is pretty well educated on on the topic. I would say just as much as I am. Now, the, the is there still things going on on this property, or do you have concerns? Kind of has anything else happened since everything well, went down? I haven't. I haven't been back. Uh, I think. Well, I went back the, the next morning. And I went back to the park and tried to sleep but couldn't uh so i went back around noon and i pulled up and started heading down down the road and i stopped and i got out because there's this red oily fluid on the ground and i thought well who the hell come up here with the leaking transmission and then i get out and i Look, I said, oh, I said, well, okay. I had originally thought he was playing possum and was trying to get me to walk over to him so he could jump up and pop my head like a pimple. But if you look at that photo, you'll see another triangular looking blood spot. And that's from where I put my shoe in it and realized what it was and tried to wipe it off. And this stuff was pretty hard to get off my shoe because it was oily. I mean, it just had like I had a film on it. 
And it was really weird to look at. And it was, it was pretty pungent. It had a note or to it. I don't know if that was from the heat, from it sitting there for uh, eight, nine hours or what. But yeah, so I see that. And I said, okay, I said, it's time to go. I said, the Black Hawks are going to be coming any minute now. And I'm, I'm, I'm still a little paranoid about it. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be paranoid about it. I, to be honest with you, if you want my my opinion, and I don't think the government cares too much. I don't think they care if you shoot them. I don't think they care. Um, you cut a head off and you bring it in, you're probably going to get a visit. But as far as shooting them and that sort of thing. It's not really what you say, it's what you can prove. And I've noticed in the past when people bring forth evidence, you know, all of a sudden the game, quote unquote game warden shows up, you know, or, um, and it's all BS. They're not game wardens. All right. Yeah. I was going to tell you to light the property up, but, um, it, it, you said it didn't have power. No, I don't. There, uh, this property hasn't had any electricity since uh, 2001. Oh, maybe that's right. I forgot you said that. That's right. And it is completely pitch black. I mean, when we lived there back in 95, 6, and 7, and even when I lived there in 2001, we had floodlight on the power pole out in front of the house. And I remember when I was a kid and I used to go up there with my grandfather for the summer, he would always tell me if I have to go outside at night to stay in the light. And other than that, at sundown, he wanted me in the house. Now, during the day, he would get me outside and get me to working on the tractor or helping him uh, plant rows of corn and peas. And he would always have a rifle and a pistol with him. And he would always look up and scan the wood line about every 15 minutes. And I thought, well, it's because he's... Uh, a veteran of WW2. Now, he was a Marine for many years, and that's just how he is. But after talking to my mom the other day, she told me something that she had failed to mention in my 40 years of life, and that was uh, when they were kids living there there was a bear had a, a huge black bear had walked up to the tree line and was slapping and clawing a tree and screaming and yelling and grandpa got real scared and they were all scared and he made him go inside and he got his rifle and he ran out back and was yelling at it saying, get the hell out of here. Don't you come back. And fired up in the air, and they were telling him, shoot it, shoot it. He said, no, no. Y'all shut up and get inside. And would never actually shoot it or even shoot at it. So he just shot up in the air, and it, he said, it just eventually turned around and walked off. I said, Mom. I said, a bear turned around and walked off to you. Well, what else would it be? Like, okay. Yeah, it's strange. You guys don't have bears out there. No. No, you don't. So I, I, these things have been on this property, I, I'm pretty sure, our entire life. And because we've always had weird things happen, you know. But... When when we lived there in 95, you know, we didn't have any neighbors. There was no one, nothing around. It was beautiful. I loved it. So we would leave our doors unlocked because the house is loaded with guns and you know, 
you know, we're really not concerned about anyone coming in. Well, I got up several times and saw that the back door was wide open. It also happened to mom several times. She'd come and woke me up and told me to grab the rifle, a flashlight, and go shut the back door. It's open, and she's scared. So living there, actually, uh, it was just the four of us and mom. Because our dad worked in Houston, and he would stay with his mother during the week and would come home on the weekends. So they're the only dominant male presence was me, and I was 15. You know, we would hear wood knocks, and I would ask, what is that? Oh, that's just a woodpecker. <laughs> okay. I would see stick structures, you know, look like a really intricate triangle or an A. and I would ask, hey, come look at this. And mom would always say, oh, that was probably your uncle. Or that was probably you or one of the other boys and you are trying to mess with me. I'm like, but yeah, and it, it, I, I had something. I'd walk down the road one day and I could hear something beyond the tree line walking with me. You know, at the time, I didn't think anything of it. I thought, well, there's all types of deer and other creatures up here. But I would get that feeling that I was being watched. You know, and it would get really, really silent. But we never had any problems, which is can only be by the grace of God. Because there are cougars, bobcats. And huge canebrake rattlesnakes in the area. We used to see a canebrake probably once a week, which is uh, just another word for timber rattlesnake. And we used to walk down this road at midnight, one in the morning, with nothing more than the glow of a cigarette. And nothing ever happened to us. And yeah, it's really, really, it's, it's a miracle. It's nothing but. It's not a miracle. It's you're a Texan, man. I mean, <laughs> only Texans can survive in Texas. <laughs> Everyone else dies, you know, either from snakes or hogs or, you know. Uh, it always cracks me up when I was down there because, you know, people who are, who are from Texas... Uh, I remember a, a water moccasin. It's what I, I forget what there. There's another name for it, but you know what I mean. A water moccasin. It was out there. Cottonmouth. Yeah, cottonmouth. Oh, there you go. And it was coming uh, across the lake to us, and it was coming to us. And uh, I was like, I've never seen a snake actually go after anyone. It was coming, and you know, I felt like. I feel like the biggest wimp in the group because I'm like, let's get the hell out of here. And all those Texas boys were like, ah, you know, it, it comes up here and gives us trouble and we'll cut its head off and blah. And I'm like, so it cracks me up, man. People in Texas, you gotta, you gotta be tough to live in Texas. Beautiful place. And uh, one thing I was going to tell you is if you go back up to that property or if you have any more issues, you give me a call. I'll fly down. Yes. I'll, I'll back you up down there. I'll, I'll bring my guns and back you up. Uh, down Absolutely. There. Yeah. <laughs> what What do you think that these creatures are? I mean, kind of what's your own personal opinion? Uh, you know, I thought about this earlier. And what I think they are is just another one of this planet's miracles they're a miracle of life they they simply exist they live they breathe they breed they bleed and we occupy the earth with them as far as them being nephilim yeah i do not know I, that's going to take a much brighter mind than mine but 
they simply are. I mean, they do exist. They are here. And that's a fair answer. You know, so do you think it's more, you think it's more of a natural, I don't think I agree with you. I don't think that they're the Nephilim and I could give about 40 different arguments why I don't think they're the Nephilim. Um, but, and there's no, obviously no wrong answer, but so you think it's more of just a natural animal? I do. I do. I, I, I think along the evolutionary trail, they just took a different path than we did. Yeah, that's a fair answer, man. You have to let me know, will you, when you're out there. Let me know if anything else happens. And that uh, so and that and that offer yeah. stands, man. You get you get trouble down there, you give me a call and I'll come down and back yep. you up. Yes, sir, man. Anytime you want to come down, well, I'll take you up there and we'll <laughs> we'll do what we can do. <laughs> I'd love to. I, I really would. And Chris, with all the uh, you know, all the tragedy you've dealt with with your life you know your dad and your daughter and uh, you're you're a good man a lot of people don't end up good men after you know so many heartaches through life life has a uh, funny way of humbling people you know it's you know i think back in my early 20s and you know i was arrogant and proud and um i think as you get older life has a, a weird way of 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 humbling us and uh no you doubt are, your daughter your high horse yeah. it absolutely but no doubt your father and your daughter are waiting for you and they're in a better place i know it doesn't bring you comfort and it's cliche to say that but um that happens to be true though i i really do i believe that with my heart you know and um especially being your daughter's anniversary, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to a bum like me. Yes, sir. Anytime. And thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks again, Chris. Take care of yourself. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.